Good morning, everyone. How is everyone? It's a little chilly today. Welcome to uh, church on this chilly morning. I can definitely say winter is kicking in. We've just come back from the mountains and apparently it's going to be snowing this week up in Katoomba. So that means a cold snap is coming. So let's all stay nice and cosy and warm in here. It's great to see you today. I hope you're all traveling well. Who's on school holidays? Keep your hand up if you're enjoying school holidays. <laughs> well, the kids are going to be in with us for church today. We don't have a kids program on. However, we do have some colouring impacts and some kids activities in the foyer. So if kids need to keep busy, we've got some things for them to do while we're in church today. Also, if you've a parent with younger children and you just want to break out and have some space, you can go next door in the hall as well. I believe we are casting the service into the hall next door. Is that correct? Yes. Fantastic. So if you just need a break, you're welcome to go into the hall next door as well. But it's great to see you all today. Today, we're going to be encouraged today by what it means to have pastoral care. And we're going to be looking at the Good Shepherd and how Jesus cares for us. So Without further ado, how about we get straight into praising our great Lord and Jesus together. So let's stand and sing our first song.
song called Beneath the Cross. take a seat but if there are any children here who would like to come and join me at the front uh, you're welcome to come and sit uh, on the rugs down here with us yeah so if any children would like to make their way down now please do 
Um, and while they're on their way, I'll just let you know, this morning uh, for our children's talk time, what I'd like to do is read uh, a book with us. Um, now, I've got the book here, so I'll read it uh, to the children as I would read a story. But um, on the screen as well, uh, for those of us that are sitting a little bit further away, we'll have the, um, the pictures uh, come up there too. So you can follow along. And I'm hoping that this might be a bit of an encouragement, even for those of us who aren't children ourselves, um, who might be reading to children, uh, to think about, yep, yeah, it's not too hard to read a story about God uh, with children and to encourage them um, that way. Uh, so let's go for it. Um, I'm going to sit down here, if that's all right, uh, camera crew. Because the pages are going to be showing, the, the screen's going to be showing the pages anyway. So here we go. Um, let's have a read. Now, this book is called The Shepherd Who Searched. The Shepherd Who Searched. Mm. There was once a good shepherd who had exactly 100 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. He knew them all by name. He counted his sheep every morning and night. One, two, three, four, five, 97, 98, 99, 100. All of them were safe in the pen. Mm. Each day, the shepherd led his sheep to a grassy meadow and found them clear water to drink. <gasps> Here's the water. I can see one sheep having a drink down there. Yum. The shepherd guarded his sheep. He used his sling and crook to keep away wolves and foxes. Oh, have a look. That's a good shot. Got him right on the head. <laughs> it's good to keep his sheep safe. Each night, he led the sheep back home. He counted his sheep. One, two, three, four... 97, 98, 99, 100. All were safe. In the morning, he counted them again. Then he led them to fresh grass and cool water. One night, he counted as usual. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 97, 98, 99. Oh, no. He must have missed a sheep. Uh-oh. He started counting all over again. One, two, three, four, five. Still only 99. Now the shepherd was very worried. One of his sheep was missing. Have a look. Can you see what the... Sh yeah, it's lost. Can you see what the shepherd's thinking? Oh, no. What might have happened? Uh-oh. He's worried. <laughs> the shepherd locked the 99 sheep safely in the pen. He lit his lamp and set off to find the lost sheep. I wonder if he'll find it. He searched up high, nothing. He searched down low, nothing. Except some bats. He searched in muddy ponds, nothing. He searched in prickly thorn bushes, nothing. <coughs> He walked for miles and miles and miles. Oh, the shepherd grew hungry and tired. Bleh. He stopped and listened. There it was again. Bleh. More softly. Could it be his lost sheep? The shepherd hurried towards the sound. It was the lost sheep. The shepherd pulled, the sheep, uh, pulled his sheep from the bush where it was stuck. The little sheep's woolly coat was torn. The shepherd gently carried the lost sheep home. When he reached the sheep pen, he counted one, two, three, four, five, 97, 98, 99, 100. All were safe in the pen again. Then the shepherd went off to find his friends. Come and celebrate, he said, because I found my sheep that was lost. Can you see them having a party there? 
And the Bible says that Jesus is the good shepherd. God is happy when Jesus finds lost people and they follow him. We can read about this story in our Bibles in Luke chapter 15, but not with all the same pictures. And that was just to encourage us and remind us how good Jesus is to look for his lost sheep. So let's pray and then we'll go back and sit with our parents again. Dear God, thank you that Jesus loves us and cares for us and finds us when we're lost. Uh, please help us to trust him and to be happy like he is happy when lost people are found. Amen. All right, uh, please find your spots and I'm going to hand back over to Emma. Thanks, Stephanie. I think I enjoy children's books as much as the kids. Anyone else feel like kids' books are just a great way to learn about the Bible? They really are. Yes, thank you, Toby, that's true. Um, we're now just coming to a time of announcements, just a couple of things to keep you updated with what is happening. Um, first of all, next Monday, so not tomorrow, but following Monday, um, it's our kids program. So what a great way to spend a pupil-free day, a great way to use that last day of holidays at an all-day kids program. This looks fantastic. And if you haven't signed up yet, don't worry, there are still a few spots left. So you can sign up today. Um, you can use oh I think I'm still on yep you can use Elvanto to sign up um, or if you'd like to sign up uh, if you don't have access to Elvanto just see John or one of our staff members for how to sign up um, also I know I mentioned before that Katoomba's a bit chilly, but um, a little bit later in the year, um, our blokes will be heading up to Katoomba um, for Base Camp Men's Conference. And this is coming up um, soon, so if you would like to sign up, um, you can sign up at basecampmen.com and just let James Mar know that you're going to get into accommodation or transport. James Mar, are you here today? He's not here today. Okay. Well, we'll get in touch with him if you would like to go to um, men's camp, which looks absolutely amazing. Um, also today kicks off, our, as I mentioned before, our pastoral care series. So um, out in the entryway, you might have noticed um, there's some pastoral care books for sale and table of cards. And John will be talking more about this in the sermon. But <clears throat> excuse me, you would have also received a card as you came in today as well. I'm not going to spoil that. I'll let John talk more about that. Um, but oh no, I'm going to talk about it apparently. So, Okay, well, John's going to talk more about it too, but we've, these are actually designed to be care cards. So it would just be a really great way to encourage each other by just taking your card and just picking a person and write a little message for them. And then you can add a sticker or a verse, put it in an envelope, and then just address it to that person. And the good news is our new directory is now coming out. It's now been all updated and it's ready to go. So you can have the up-to-date address for the person, which is awesome. Um, I just dropped something. Hang on. Okay. Um, lastly, uh, last announcement today, and this is something that is just in regards to morning tea, something that you'll notice or maybe you won't notice because we've just finished the um, sound dampening project out in the hall. So when you go out to morning tea today, you might notice the lack of sound. And we just want to take a moment to thank um, all those whose generosity made that project possible, just to lower the sound a little bit in the hall. It's greatly appreciated. So I hope you enjoyed the lack of noise today in the hall. Um, before we get into the rest of our service today, as I mentioned, we're talking a bit more about pastoral care. And so what I thought would be a great opportunity now before we have our next song is two things. First of all, I'd like you to take a moment to say hello to the person next to you or maybe look around to see if someone hasn't got someone sitting next to them. And I would like you to ask them this question. So, oh, it's great. They're already talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that worked a lot better than I thought it would. <laughs> Hi, guys. 
And as you're talking, I would like you to ask them just one question. So when you're talking, I'd like you to find out when there was a time that you felt cared for or when there was a time that you felt you were looked after. Maybe it was during a time of struggle. Maybe you were unwell. I want you to have a chat to the person next to you about what does it look like to be cared for and what does good pastoral care look like? So go back to chatting. I love that you guys all chatted as soon as I told you to do it and then we'll have our next song soon. We hope that you continue those conversations after we've heard the sermon and when we're chatting over morning tea. We're now going to lead us in another song, Great is the Lord. Please stand as we sing this song.
time in prayer together now uh, to bring uh, our requests before our great God. Um, please join me uh, in some prayer now and that I'll lead us in and then we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer at the end. Our great Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and the wonderful joy that it is to know him as our Lord, Saviour and Shepherd. Today we particularly thank you for his gentle and loving but firm care for us in leading and guiding us to live for your kingdom. Please, in your goodness, Father, allow us to show others the same undeserved love and care that Jesus has given us. Let our church be a place full of caring for each other, not just spiritually, but also physically and emotionally by our presence and by prayers. This morning, we particularly bring before you those members of our church family and community who are becoming older and more frail. Even though we do not see many of them regularly, since failing health may mean they're not able to gather physically with us anymore, we pray that we might learn from their example of faithfulness. And please grant them strength and vigor as they face the challenges of growing older and give them patience and hope in times of illness. In this last season of their life on earth, Continue to bless them with spiritual growth and a sense of closeness with you. Father, as we look towards our Holiday Kids Club coming up in a week's time, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to welcome many children onto our church property and we praise you for the great buildings and facilities that we have here at Panania to make that possible. We particularly thank you for the new soundproofing in the hall this week. Please do bring along next uh, week to Holiday Kids Club, bring many children from our local area, including those who have never heard of Jesus before, and help us to share his good news with them in ways that they can relate to and understand. Thank you for Ros Hicks and her partnership with us in coming to lead the main Bible sessions at the Holiday Club. And please also be with all the leaders, especially the many junior leaders and those new to teaching, so that they might relate well with the children and by their lives and positive interactions, show what it means to live for you. In our world more widely, Lord, there seems to be so much turmoil and unrest. We bring before you countries that have experienced significant political change recently. Please, in your mercy, appoint wise leaders to places of authority and let them govern for the good of their people and not for personal gain. And Father, we pray for Christians living in situations of political unrest. Help them to trust you to be good citizens and to pray for their leaders. And we also pray for our leaders here in Australia. In your mercy, please guide and uphold them as they govern our nation. Allow Australia to continue as a place of freedom and justice. And help us to make the most of every opportunity you bless us with in this land of free speech so that we might reasonably and winsomely make known the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen. And please join me uh, in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's continue now in a time of reflection. As we come before the Lord, um, we're now going to come to a time of confession. So please join with me as we read the words together on the screen. Sorry, I'll lead us first. Although we are the people of God, Scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus died for us and intercedes with us for the Father. Let us draw near to God who freely forgives through his infinite goodness and mercy and pray to him with sincerity and confidence. Together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. 
Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. And just to be reminded that God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his son, Jesus Christ, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. I'm now going to invite our Bible readers to come forward. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Liz. So the first reading, first reading is from Ezekiel, chapter 34, the first 16 verses. It can be found on page 854 of the Pew Bible. It's the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 34. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves, with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for the wild animals. My sheep wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd, and so has been plundered, and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than for my flock, therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on the day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I'll bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and make them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Thank you. Today's second reading is taken from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 to 18, and can be found on page 1062 of the Pew Bibles. That's John, chapter 10, starting at verse 1. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognise a stranger's voice. 
Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were sheep and robbers, were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Well, it's great to be in church with you. I uh, hope you're well this morning and ready to get into God's Word. Great to have the young ones with us as well. That's a blessing, especially in the holidays. Uh, it's not just a concession. We actually want to have those moments in church life where everyone is in the same room worshipping together. So it's a good thing. Uh, there are some aids out there, some colouring in. There's a, a creche room where you can hear and a parents' room where you can hear what's going on in here. Uh, and even in the hall, we've got a, a feed going out there so you can watch the video and there's more space. But kids are welcome in this room and we love it. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we, we just ask that as we've opened your word, you might feed us, that you might nourish us, and that we might go out from here well fed by your word this morning. Amen. Ba ba black sheep. You know the rhyme, but here's the 1765 original version from Mother Goose. Goes like this. Bar, bar, black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, Mary, I have three bags full, one for my master, one for my dame, but none for the little boy who cries in the lane. What is that about? The historians tell us that may just be a protest against the English wool tax. A protest against the English wool tax. That is, you've got three bags of wool, one for me, but then one for my master, the king, one for the dame, the nobility, and none left for sharing with anyone else, the little boy who cries down the lane. The point being, those entrusted with the care of the common people are fleecing them. There you go. I'm going I'm to have a lot of bad, bad puns this morning. This is, just prepare yourself. Shepherding, though, shepherding is one of the, the great and oldest images of leadership. A leader is supposed to be like a shepherd, feeding the sheep, not fleecing them. That's actually kind of a, a transcultural metaphor. That is, people from all cultures know about caring for animals and the role of the leader is supposed to care for them. In the Bible, of course, that's the image of the pastor, the pastor. Pastor is just the Latin word for shepherd, but there's a person who's supposed to care for God's flock. And so as we start a series on pastoral care, that's just the kind of care that should be taken of the sheep. Nowadays, everyone's actually talking about pastoral care. If you've read the management textbooks and the, the parenting books and the counselling and the community development, everyone now talks about pastoral care. But we had it first, okay? We had it first, the shepherd's care for the sheep, especially in the sheep pen of the church. So we're doing a two-week mini-series on pastoral care, and this comes out of two concerns, okay? Okay. One concern is that although we've got some structures of care in church life, we've got a pastoral staff team, we've got 
Bible study groups. That's a, a, a great engine room for pastoral care. Some of us have friendship networks. Even despite that, the concern is that some people might fall through the cracks. We're not happy with 99 out of 100. We want to make sure that all 100 are cared for. That's one concern. The other concern is that if we are very serious about our church priorities, we've said our number one church priority is sharing the gospel. That's what you're thinking, sharing the gospel. And that includes engaging this diverse community around us. Most of those cultures around us are communal cultures. But most of us are part of an individualistic culture. And so there's a, there's a problem there, isn't it? How, how are people ever going to come close enough to hear the good news of Jesus if they see an absence of communal care? This is a genuine concern. People have left this church, even in recent times, feeling uncared for. So there's a real concern behind this series. That's why we're talking about pastoral care. This week, we're going to talk about the good pastor. What is good pastoral care? What's the model behind it? And next week, we'll talk about the gifted pastor. That is, how has God equipped people in different ways for care? This week, we might say the heart. Next week, the hands of pastoral care. Now, to help you in this series, we have a book out there, a great book by Jill McGilvray called uh, God's Love for Everyone, Pastoral Care. God's Love in Action, Pastoral Care for Everyone. Uh, you can grab that book at half price, I think it is out there, compared to Kurong. But this series is also going to have some practical ideas for you. One jumpstart idea for you this morning, I'll get to in a few minutes. And then next week, another great idea that's going to help you just get, get involved, get engaged in pastoral care. And after this series, Jackie's actually going to gather a group to think more intentionally about how we do pastoral care as a church. But it starts today, the good pastor we're talking about. And you'll want to have John 10 open, uh, the number's over there, uh, the page number. But we're going to start with the Old Testament, because in the Old Testament, there's a very interesting pattern you may not have noticed. But in the Old Testament, everyone who's anyone is a shepherd. Do you know this? They're all shepherds. Abraham, shepherd. Moses, shepherd. David, King David, shepherd. God has this habit, this pattern of putting actual shepherds in charge of his people. Why does he do that? Because God is a shepherd. God is a pastor. That's what he's like. And he, he appoints leaders after his own heart. And so when we talk about pastoral care, we have to start with God. God models for us. God cares for us in a shepherding way. Here's a couple of great places to go. Isaiah chapter 40. God tends his flock like a shepherd. It says it. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. Or maybe your mind went here first. Here's the most famous one. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside the still waters, refreshes my soul, guides me on the right paths. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, your shepherd's crook, comfort me. That's God's kind of pastoral care. It's practical, of course. There's direction and provision and protection. But it's more than that, isn't it? it, it it's spiritual too. It's soul-refreshing care. It's personal, knowing care. So first thing to just note is God is a good pastor. And so when he appoints leaders for his people, he wants pastors with his own pastoral heart. Abraham, Moses, David, people who, who won't just provide for the sheep, They'll go that step further. They'll bring back the stray sheep. They'll save the flock. That's part of the pastoral image, isn't it? That the sheep are wayward. That's what sheep do. They wander off. God's people need someone to bring them back. In fact, that's what Moses prayed. As Moses, the great shepherd in the Old Testament, was about to die, here's what he prayed for God's people. May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in so the Lord's people will not be 
like a sheep without a shepherd. He knows what they need. And they don't just need feeding, the going out, they need the saving, they need to come back in again safely. In fact, that's what it says in Zechariah, it says it straight out for us, the Lord their God will save his people like a shepherd saves his flock. So that's the, that's the Old Testament image, okay, of pastoral care, someone entrusted by God with the care, the practical and spiritual care of God's flock, But at the same time, if you've read the Old Testament at all, you realise no one does it. No one does it very well. No one can be like God. Even the best shepherds fail. Remember David? Remember Nathan, the prophet, came to him and told him the little story about someone stealing a lamb? And that was David. David was fleecing the flock. The truth is, as Ezekiel 34 told us, The shepherds of Israel are bad shepherds, not good shepherds. And so we're left, at the end of the Old Testament, you're left just kind of longing for a better kind of pastoral care. If the sheep are off track, what what is it they need that they haven't got? But then wonderfully, you come into the New Testament and Jesus Christ comes and he's a pastor. He's a shepherd What does he say? I am the good shepherd. He's come exactly what Ezekiel 34 said, to search for the sheep and care for them, to seek and save what was lost, Jesus says. And if you read about Jesus' life, he is a good pastor, isn't he? He's a good shepherd. He sees the crowds with the eyes of compassion, And he actually says, it actually says, he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. He's the fulfillment of Moses' prayer. God answers Moses' prayer with Jesus. The shepherd who goes out looking for the strays and brings them home. He tells himself the parable of the lost sheep that we did a moment ago. John 10, though, we read out John 10, the classic passage of the Good Shepherd, and Jesus is describing his kind of pastoral care for us. If you've got it open there, let me just point out a couple of the the elements of pastoral care from Jesus' point of view. Verse 3, he calls his own sheep, the Good Shepherd does, he calls them by name and they know him. It's a personal knowing kind of care. Verse 9, they come in and go out and find pasture. It's practical care. There's daily bread. Verse 10, he comes that they might have life overflowing. Not just practical care, but eternal life. Soul refreshing care. And then verse 11, he comes to lay down his life. For the sheep. And here's where Jesus is the only, truly, ultimately good shepherd because he puts himself in the sheep's place. He goes through that darkest valley of death instead of the sheep. So the end can be that they are with him in his care forever. In fact, that's how the New Testament ends, you know, with a pastoral image. Here's Revelation. The lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. See what that's saying? Heaven is eternal pastoral care. That's what actually any any attempt at pastoral care is not just looking back to Jesus, it's looking forward to heaven and God walking with his people. So God is the good shepherd. But in the New Testament, he does, again, make a pattern and a habit of appointing shepherds after his own heart for his people. Not instead of Jesus, but actually under Jesus. His under shepherds, they're called. Jesus is still the saviour, but God does entrust under Jesus people with the pastoral care of the flock. Here's what Paul says to the church in Ephesus. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. 
Or perhaps you remember Jesus to Peter says three times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. That's your job. The care of the church, the pastoral care. So there's a pastoral picture of church in the New Testament. But at that point, you could go wrong because you hear that and you say, well, that's right, we've got pastors and we need pastoral care and, and that's, that's who does it. We've outsourced pastoral care to a, to a certain group within church life. That's not, that's not the New Testament picture. Pastoral care in the church is actually like evangelism in the church. You know how we've got capital E evangelists? God has some people he's appointed to, to rally and lead and equip the church in evangelism so we can all do it. We're all on mission together. It's the same with pastoral care. In fact, here's my little model for you. I've got a picture. Yes, God appoints capital P pastors to lead and equip and rally the troops for pastoral care. And we have a, a pastoral staff team. But... The idea is that they equip them so that we all care for the church. If you read on in Ezekiel chapter 34, you'll find that the prophet actually turns from the shepherds to the sheep and gives them the same judgment. It says, you sheep, you've been trampling the pasture for the others. You've been driving the other sheep away. It says, actually, we've got the same problem with the shepherds and the sheep. No one's taking care of each other. So no, we don't outsource pastoral care just to the pastors. Pastoral care is communal care because we're all following Jesus together. We're all on that same level under Jesus. And remember what Jesus said at the Last Supper, John 13, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. That's the New Testament image of church, is this kind of one anothering of care. And yes, some people are gifted in certain ways for caring. We'll see that next week. That's what we'll talk about. But care is not a spiritual gift. Care is the outcome when we exercise our spiritual gifts, just like love. It isn't that some people here have the spiritual gift of love. No, we all love as we exercise whatever gifts God's given us. More on that next week. But here's a grab from the book that we have on sale out there. Jill says, caring for one another, loving one another, is fundamental to our life as Christians. It's not dependent on having plenty of free time or being an extrovert or even naturally liking people. Someone, I guarantee someone here is saying, yeah, but I just hate people. I love the church, I just hate people. You're still not out of the picture for pastoral care. More next week. Pastoral care is just what naturally happens when God puts, puts a bunch of saved sheep together in the one pen. And it's better this way, you realise. It's better we all share instead of burning out a few people in pastoral care. That's what sometimes happens in church life. Here's a, a little quote from Henry Nguyen. He says, we shouldn't try to care by ourselves. Care is not an endurance test. We should, whenever possible, care together with others. It's the community of care that reminds the person being cared for of their belovedness in Christ. I think that's right, isn't it? So the point is, if Jesus is your good shepherd, then you know what good pastoral care looks like. Still, we haven't actually kind of defined pastoral care, and I don't want to finish this morning without defining pastoral care for us. So here's what we're talking about. Pastoral care is the way God shepherds his people via his people. It's like we're the agents of God's own care. So Hebrews 13, here's, here's the model verse for you. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. You see that the heart of pastoral care is the cross and the gospel, but now through God's gifting of us with grace. Therefore, we are now equipped to do pastoral care ourselves. All kinds of care there are, but 
just for this morning, before we get into the details next week, I want to say that there are then two types of pastoral care we're really talking about. As we work for a definition, we're going to have to say, well, there's, there's going to be those two sides of it. There's going to be the practical care, the leading out to pasture, and there's going to be the spiritual care. There's the concern for the salvation of the sheep. And those aren't somehow two different gifts. You're either gifted for the, the practical care or the spiritual care. No, they're two sides, two sides of pastoral care. So here's a, here's a textbook definition for you. Pastoral care is the practical outworking of the church's concern for the everyday and ultimate needs of its members and the wider community. It doesn't stop in the church. That concern has as its mainspring the love that God has for his people in the world. So you see that? God is the good shepherd, but as a result, we see him and we, we have that concern for the practical and ultimate needs of people, the spiritual and the practical. So two main types of pastoral care, but there are a million acts of care. And maybe you think, yes, but what does pastoral care actually look like if we were doing it? Well, let me read you from Jill's book. We don't have it on the screen, but listen, here, here's, here's her just throwing a bit of a, a scattering of pastoral care seeds out. Here's what she says. She says, maybe, maybe you notice people missing, or you provide a meal, or you send a card, or you help someone find a ministry, or you pop into a shut-in and, and do something with them. Maybe you invite someone to something they'd enjoy, offer to read for someone with failing eyesight, take someone out for a drive or for coffee. Offer to babysit, remember them, pray for them, update them, ask what would help most. There's a million acts of pastoral care, but you know the hardest one? The hardest one is the first one. The hardest one is the first one. As I read that list, maybe it occurred to you, I'm not sure I've done any of those things this year. The hardest one is the first one. And so that's why in this series we want to jump start a bit of pastoral care by one particular practical tip each week. So you've, you've been noticing that card that was put in your hand at the start of the service. Here's what it's for. I think I've got one here. The point of these cards is this is a care card, okay? I think we've got a slide for the care cards that's put up for you. The idea is pick a person and write something for them. One sentence. Don't write, you know, can't write it to the staff team. The staff team are off limits for this exercise, okay? You've got the card there. There are pens in your seats. You could start writing right now. But pick a person and just write them a couple of sentences. And this is something we're actually going to send to them, okay? This is going to be a, a, a real practical exercise. We're going to send to them. And it could be one of three things. It could be a thank you card. It could be, dear Boris... I've just been blessed by your ministry lately. You've been doing this, and, and I'm just thanking God for you. Full stop. There's, there's a thank you card. Or it could be a praying for you card. Dear Zena, uh, I know it's tough for you right now. I've just been thinking for you and praying for you uh, and just wanted to reach out with a card uh, to say I'm remembering you. Full stop. Or... Uh, it could be a, a missing you card. This is my third type of card that I like to send, a missing you card. Dear Justine, just, I'm trying to pick names that aren't in the room. Justine, uh, dear Justine, haven't seen you around for a few weeks. Just been missing you. I uh, love your smiling face at church. I uh, hope you're going okay. I'm going to pop in this week. Full stop. Imagine you wrote a card like that. To jumpstart you on that, I, I commend you, there's not, not enough people writing. Grab a pen, they're in the little holders at the end of the seat. We're going to pause. I'm going to do it too. We're going to pause and write a card. And to make it super easy, if you write the card out on the table, there, and you've got an envelope, put it in the envelope. Uh, there's actually some extra bits and pieces like a card buffet out there, a little Bible verse or a sticker you could put on. Check out the table. And if you put it in the envelope, and if you address it, the, the parish directories are out there so you can look up a name then put it in the mail tray we'll put a stamp on it we'll pay for the postage and we'll put it in the mail for you this week okay I'm serious and imagine imagine if a hundred people from our church this week get a card we don't want all the same person to get the card so maybe don't pick the top of your list pick someone halfway down who occurs to you after a few thoughts but but I, I, what, a, what a wonderful thing it would be this week. If, if you're here and you don't know anyone, write it to someone who you think could do some care and we'll still mail it for you if you address it. That's okay. 
But I'm going to do mine. We're going to take 30 seconds to finish, finish off. Okay, as you finish that off, just, just imagine what difference it would make to receive a card in the mail. People never put stuff in the mail anymore. That's why it's such a good action of care. If you didn't get a card, grab one on the, the way out. They're still on the table. And on top of that, we don't want this to be a one-shot wonder. We're actually, we've, we've screwed into the wall a little care card uh, holder, and we're going to keep that stocked with cards from now on. So if someone's on your heart after church, walk out there, grab the card, write it on the spot, and you'll be able to, to mail that and know you've... you've converted your care for someone into a practical action. There are a million acts of pastoral care, and we'll talk next week about how God may have equipped you with special gifts for care in some way. But remember the two types, spiritual and practical, two sides of the same coin. You can't have a concern that someone's stomach might be empty without also having a question in your heart, is their soul empty? What can I do for them in that area? And likewise, you, you, can't be, you can't just notice that someone's not at church and not also th- notice that they're far from church and they might need some transport help. Two sides of the same coin, spiritual and pastoral. Well, friends, the, the wool trade, where we started, the wool trade was the backbone of life in the 1700s. Australia, not too long ago, was riding on the sheep's back, they said. But in church life, pastoral care is the trade that church life runs on, pastoral care. We don't want anyone crying down the lane, slipping through the cracks. And as we try and welcome our diverse community, we don't want them to see an absence of communal care. We want them to see what the good shepherd is like through us, the good shepherd who laid his life down for the sheep and who continues to shepherd his sheep via his people. Amen, and let's sing. Please stand as we sing, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need. in part. 
we've certainly been encouraged today about what it means to encourage and look after each other. And I was so encouraged by the fact that when I asked you guys to have a conversation with each other, there was no problem with you guys having a chat, which is fantastic. So I encourage you now to continue those conversations as we meet over morning tea. And let's continue to talk about how we can look after each other and make sure that we fill in those cards to send to people to encourage them. It's been great to see you all this morning. I hope that you'll have a wonderful week. Stay nice and warm and cosy and we'll see you next week. God bless everyone.